A very good morning, everyone. I'm Vidya Ram Kumar, Professor and India Alliance Intermediate Fellow in Clinical and Public Health Research at the Faculty of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology here at Srihar Deemed University, Chennai, India. I'm very thankful for this opportunity given to me by the Audiology Committee of IALP to share some of my work here in India on community-based early identification and rehabilitation projects and models that we have set up primarily for childhood hearing loss, uh, but now also for communication disorders. Uh, and also I will be talking about how we're using information and communication technology shortly called as ICT, which includes e-health and health telepractice to be able to support some of these community-based models. Um, so I just have very quickly uh, some disclosures. So I'm a full-time employee here at the Faculty of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology. I'm also a grant fellow currently. And all the work that I'm sharing today is funded through different organizations. I'm also a board member of the Enability Foundation for Rehabilitation, which focuses on assistive technology. And I'm an executive committee member of the Rural Women's Social Education Center. Uh, a lot of y'all may know India, but for the world audience, just to give a little bit of a, an idea, I come from the southern state of Tamil Nadu that you see in yellow around the ocean and the, the coastal city of Chennai. And uh, for an extra trivia, we are bracing a very major cyclonic storm that probably will hit us tomorrow day after. Uh, the work that I've been focusing on uh, in the last decade or more uh, is primarily on building community-based models of care for hearing as well as childhood communication disorders. Uh, more recently, also using implementation science frameworks and research principles to guide some of this work that we do. As I said, along with the community-based model, the focus also has been on how to effectively use digital tools to support these activities, therefore mHealth, eHealth, telepractice, and so on. But the focus has again been with rural services and now also moving into low-cost devices, assistive technologies for persons with disabilities. Again, I, you know, several of you may know India uh, and also may know, you know, very the general aspects like how large the country is, how diverse the country is, the multiple languages spoken, and uh, there's a big population that we are looking at. And also maybe what comes to your mind when we look at India is that, you know, Bombay, Delhi, Chennai, Kolkata, Bangalore, the major cities. Now, surely the major cities are really steering a huge momentum. There's huge development. There's lots of resources. There's lots of access. And uh, clearly we are uh, now in a very dynamic phase of growth and development in terms of technology. And there's, there's a whole boom, uh, economic boom happening. That's on one side. But the, on the other side, you know, all of this that's happening is more restricted to the urban or the metropolitan. And the urban community in itself is only 36%. And the vast majority continues to be rural, which is now currently about 64%. And I also wanted to give you a little bit of the structure, the way India is, because that will help you understand the rest of my presentation. India is split into multiple states, which you see on the map with different colors. That's the basic broad bifurcation. And these are more language-based. The way it's evolved is each of the colors speak one language, mostly. And each of the states are subdivided into districts. These are districts are the next level of administrative units. And here you will see on an average, 2 million people within a district. And the district is further divided into blocks where you will see an, on an average of about 0.1 million people. And the blocks are further split into villages where you will find on an average of about 30,000 people. This average is a very skewed average. Uh, the range can be very vast. Like, for example, a state like Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the largest states, 
uh, can have very large numbers, whereas a Kerala or Goa, which are smaller states, can have much smaller units. But this is just to give you an idea of what the kind of numbers can be. Now, against this backdrop, if you need to understand the demand versus capacity, if you the most recent Rehabilitation Council of India's report suggests that the number of audiologists, speech language pathologists to population is 0.77 to 1 lakh population. Now, this now audiology and speech language pathology is still a combined program here, and um, many of them do have to practice as either or. Uh, and then while it's unfair to make a comparison with an advanced country, but just to give you the idea, because I'm going to talk a little bit more on how the, why this is important. If you see UK and USA, you're looking at 261 to a lakh versus 64 to a lakh. Now, these, these countries actually have audiology and speech language pathology separately. So for the sake of comparison, I've put, pulled the data together and derived at these numbers. Um, so they may be a uh, little bit here and there, but broadly, this is, this is what it looks like. Now, the reason I've put these numbers is that the tendency generally for countries that, uh, you know, countries that are trying to evolve their systems or bring in best practices or bring in um, interventions is to look up to what's already been done in the advanced countries. And rightly so, because, you know, somebody's already done it, it's good. Uh, it's just good nature to go back and see what has been done, what has worked, and see, uh, you know, how we can take that forward. Now, that's what's called as evidence-based practice. So typically, what we're talking about is we're looking at evidence-based or evidence from these advanced countries. And then we're trying to implement some of these practices within our countries. And when we do that, what happens is there's a we forget the gap that exists, just what I showed you right now, the vast population, the diversity of population, diverse languages, the stark contrast of population to professional availability. While we know all of this on paper, when we actually put it down and say we want to implement something, somehow this loses focus and we believe we begin to believe that, you no, know, we need those evidence-based practices in our country. But what happens is when you do that, it's now very well known that evidence-based cannot be a plug-and-play approach. I can't take something from somewhere and just fit it into my context. It's very important to understand local context and contextualize these evidence-based practices in a manner that is more palatable, acceptable, and integratable into our societies. So typically, you know, early identification, which is what I'm talking to you about today, early identification and rehabilitation is something that several low middle income countries have wanted, have known that because the burden of, uh, you know, these disabilities is much higher in these regions, there has been a lot of effort by well meaning people to bring in some of these programs. Now, despite that, the efforts have primarily been restricted to university hospitals or private organizations. And we've, we recently conducted a low middle income country uh, systematic review to see what is happening with EDI. And we found that it was mostly from these kind of organizations. Uh, but at a national level policy, very few countries were able to do something for hearing loss or developmental disability as a national program. So for example, South Africa has a program now since 2015. Thailand seems to have something from 2015. Similarly, India also has a program as of 2013, which is the Rashtriya Bal Swasthya Karyakram, which is conceptualized as a both community as well as facility level program for early detection, early intervention, <coughs> and follow-up care at the district level. So there's a state and then at district level is what they're focusing on. Now, this program focuses not just on disability, but it's meant to focus on disease, disorder, and disability across 0 to 18 years of age. Now, when I looked recently at what were the outcomes of this pro program, and uh, these, you know, anecdotally, we knew many of these, but this was truly, you know, sort of validating what we knew about these programs, is that there's a, there's a lot of focus on screening, and we found that in our systematic review as well, that even across many low, low middle income countries, people often focus too much on the screening, 
but there was no follow up diagnosis or rehabilitation in terms of even infrastructure availability there was a stark shortage of rehabilitation professionals mostly people were complaining more about the audiologist speech language pathologists being less available uh, there was an intention to use telemedicine or there's there's they felt that it would address the gap but it had not been put in and they the the concern was that the program was focusing more on disease disorders but the disability was getting sidelined and those involved in the front line were not really trained to pick up developmental disabilities so there was a lot of barriers to getting past the screening stage so with this background information of how india looks like what is the structure of india what has already been put in place towards early identification and rehabilitation and what are some of the problems i want to take you now to what is our piece and what have we tried to do in the last 13 14 years uh, as a private organization so in the first first 5 6 years uh, when we started out what we wanted primarily to know was how can we do these community level services the rural services for childhood hearing loss so we focused a lot on childhood hearing loss initially uh, after which we became a little bit more macroscopic because it was more meaningful to be that way once you reach the last mile than be very myopic uh, in our vision so we became a little bit broader and uh, so initially we focused on how do we go past the screening phase how do we bring in di good diagnostics to places that don't have it then we also went into how do we provide rehabilitation services how do we do task shifting to community level workers to reduce the strain on the audio on the already strained few audiology speech language pathologists and then we wanted to clearly know how to build these models are they good enough and that's the lesson that we picked up from the our initial projects and because we were young and new in our efforts we did not get so much support from the government so we went with non government organizations in these rural areas to start some of our work so uh, I, all of this was initiated in the red region in tamil nadu the state of tamil nadu where i come from and then now currently there is interest because we've now moved to a phase of implementation and translation and working with the government here there's interest in our neighboring state karnataka there's interest in rajasthan in our neighboring countries like bhutan and sri lanka to replicate some of these models and we are working with them currently to to be able to do some of this translation uh we had a very grand inauguration of this project back in 2010 uh by the then president of india a big visionary uh dr apj abdul kalam who's also had a pet project on indigenous cochlear implants so i'm not going to go into each of these projects but i do want to share some of the lessons from three key projects because that will help you see and connect with the current project that we are doing uh so we were funded through the indian council of medical research to understand if we had to set up an edi program in a rural community can frontline workers then become the people who will screen and can telepractice solve the problem of lack of diagnostic facilities in these rural areas and can we use the help of these frontline workers to be the telefacilitators supporting these remote diagnostics so what we did was we trained community or local village health workers they were usually just volunteers through the ngo uh, to be able to do auto acoustic emission screening in person in these communities we also had to train technicians to deploy satellite internet because in 20 2009 2010 when we started we did not have much broadband internet in these places so we used to i'll show you in the next slide a fancy van with a large dish antenna and we had to deploy that to get some internet and post this we sent them to the community to do the screening uh, and then follow up diagnostics remotely uh, in these communities and what we used to do was we used to collect all the children who had referred in that particular month and send this van into the villages and get the parents to come in and the health trained health worker would hook up the electrodes 
uh, headphones and all that we need, transducers, all that we needed to, and for me to remotely take over the systems through internet, perform the tests, as well as communicate through video conferencing with the families to tell them the hearing status. We also did diagnostic OEs, video autoscopies within this project. We have several publications uh, that came out of this. I'll be happy to share this with you if any of you write to me uh, or you're welcome to look at it into Google Scholar or any of uh, the search portals. We subsequently also developed an app on a very simple Symbion phone as we were expanding our projects to other districts and we were doing also a parallel project in cleft lip and palate uh, in our rural communities to be able to bridge or link up between the community and us, the audiologists, speech language pathologists sitting in these hospitals here. Because we wanted to remotely understand the work that was being done by community workers, the, uh, the, the status of the people who are being screened, whether they need referrals, follow up, and track their appointments as well. So we had this software with which we were able to track high risk factors in these communities we were able to track the follow-ups, the screening and the follow-up diagnostics that were required for these children. Uh, subsequently, we also start, we also worked with Medtronics India Private Limited in 2017 to implement a video autoscopy uh, project where we trained community workers to detect middle ear and hearing diseases among primarily individuals with cleft lip and palate. Uh, and this was very important because for a very long time, we were doing autoscopies within the community. Like we would go on a cam, look at the ear, and then tell them that you need to come to the hospital for to see the ENT because ENTs were not coming with us to those camps all the time. And then there were only 20% of them followed up when we asked them to come. And then we would see that when they came, they actually had developed severe progression of the diseases, had lost hearing, which becomes more permanent because it erodes the bones uh, and sometimes even came with the attic diseases. So when, we, so when we wanted to look at how can we bridge this issue of follow-up, we trained our community workers on doing these video autoscopies. We gave them hands-on training, ensured that they had the skill sets to be able to perform these independently in the community. And then they would capture these images load it on the phone, we will receive it in our end, verify and those that needed to be seen by the ENT were forwarded through a cloud and the ENT would make a final diagnosis based on those images. And of course, if it was not clear, then he would say repeat the autoscopy. Uh, but otherwise he was making recommendations for tympanometry, gourmet insertions, etc. And we would then pass on this information back to the uh, individual with prescriptions as a courier, because back then e-prescriptions were, uh, were not allowed. And the courier would then reach them and they would pick up those medicines. Now, what we found was that in 13 months of implementation of this intervention, we saw that from 20% follow-up, we had an 80% follow-up at the hospital. And that, we, and that was because they were getting the diagnosis at the doorstep. They were not ha having to travel 200 kilometers to know whether there is something wrong or not. They knew there was something wrong and they knew they were coming here to get the follow-up action. Uh, and so we, it verified that it's important to have the diagnosis at the community level, closer to them, closer to the villages, uh, so that their ability to take things seriously, to know that there's a problem was much higher. Again, there are publications that have come out of this and uh, you're welcome to read them for a more detailed explanation of these projects. So from, I know I've only gone to three of these, but we've done several others uh, for, you know, like for example, de destitute and orphan children, we've set up rehab programs and all of them by task shifting some aspects to local teachers or community workers, and from all of these, what we gathered was that a bottom-up approach works. We, are, we can establish good community-based models. We can task shift to community workers and we know how to train them such that they can bring good outcomes. 
we also learned how to contextualize audiology practice uh, so that it can suit what is prevalent or the environment and the context that is available that is prevalent here on the flip side we also these are problems but i won't say we've we've learned to sort of maneuver through them they still exist and you can't do away with them one is poor internet no matter what somehow the priorities will always remain with the booming cities maybe at least towns but i don't think the rural areas will come into the forefront for still longer time even though in india we are planning to have some bharat net which is meant to connect rural areas the other is maintaining standards at far sight i think when we are doing audiology work or any clinical work in uh, out in the open in a community setting there is concern of maintaining standards but what we now know is how do we get this done okay, like what do we look for and how do we get it done and when you are training community workers there's a learning curve it takes them that much time to get it right there's also attrition so we need to factor all this in when we build these models and these are the key lessons that we learned so from all these lessons that we learned we now put together a project which is a comprehensive model that not just looks at screening identification but also at rehabilitation of children between 0 to 6 years of age the window of 0 to 6 years uh, is because in india that is the age group that is considered for early identification uh, as well as social welfare schemes uh, are targeted towards this group and therefore we retained that same definition and aligned it to that definition and we are currently working with the government of tamil nadu translating all of what we learned into models in our districts here currently uh so we tentatively built a model based on our previous understanding so what we knew was we could task shift screening to community level workers and therefore it can happen at the village level uh we also wanted to have low cost screening tools that are one tenth the cost of the internationally available tools to make it very very appealing and easy for anyone to be able to take it up and do it uh we also identified that providing diagnostics as well as rehabilitation has to happen closer to their homes and therefore the block level uh is where we wanted to put in these services and we had temp- tentatively identified special educators as as some of the supporting staff who will assist in telepractice and be the bridge between the and the, the individual and the audiology speech language pathologist and we conceptualized uh, both a government model as well as a public private partnership model where we said either this work can be done by the audiology speech language pathologist at the tertiary care or the district level or it could be anybody anywhere who's a private audiology speech language pathologist uh you know who can fill the gap in the government and provide services remotely to these block level entities now this was a broad model we did not exactly say where who how uh, because we wanted that to emerge from a situation analysis that we ran in these districts before we froze the model so we wanted to do sufficient stakeholder engagement before finalizing the model and i'll show you how we did that and we this time used a consolidated framework for implementation research to understand the intervention characteristics and context in a more scientific manner and we also chose the bowens feasibility framework to understand the outcomes of our implementation within the government public health system uh so this project involves various aspects and for each of these aspects we have collaborators who are highly accomplished in their own areas we have uh, social scientists engineers speech language pathologists government the state commissioner for for persons with uh, disability uh, as well as uh, those who with experience in community based work prior experience with community based work who are involved in various aspects of this particular project so as i said the first step was to understand what did the stakeholders different stakeholders who would be involved in an early identification uh, program want are they ready to use technology you know what many of us probably thought was uh, you know this is in, this started in 2020 in the middle of covid and uh, you know while on one side everybody was getting familiar with video conferencing and other things uh, it was probably not the reality of a large 
uh, number of rural people. Therefore, we really wanted to understand, you know, how do we meaningfully plug technology what, so that it's not overwhelming, it's usable, uh, and it bridges the gap that we're looking at. So we spoke to parents, both mothers, fathers of children with disability. We spoke to the commissioners, policymakers, administrative officers within the government who are responsible for, for any child and disability related services, uh, special educators, Anganwadi workers, who are the government primary school teachers, village health nurses, community workers, NGOs, and we gathered information, verified our model, asked information about who they think should screen, who they think should do the telefacilitation, where should it be done, what do they think will be helpful, and, uh, and any more changes that they think we should bring to our model. So what we found was that we were able to verify that they did want access at the block level for diagnostics and rehabilitation, especially the parents when we, looked, when we asked them they said they were not getting consistent rehabilitation, which verified our, our previous uh, re review of literature. Uh, they suggested points of care to be primary health centers. They said club health and disability together. We don't want them to be separate entities. They also pointed us towards what we call the Sarva Siksha Abhyan or Samagra Siksha, Siksha Abhyan, which is an education for all program that exists in every block. Uh, and they said that would be a good place. They also directed us to a mobile van that is available within the communities. And they suggested that these vans can be used for diagnosti diagnostics as well as rehabilitation. They also clearly said while they are good with telehealth for screening and diagnostics, they preferred a hybrid approach for rehabilitation. And they did not want us to come to their homes or they, they, did, they were not expecting services at homes, but they were okay to step out somewhere for services. These were very, very important lessons uh, that we built into the model. When we looked at the providers, even audiologists, speech language pathologists were working within the government setup. We identified the carders that they felt would be suited for screening. We identified that some, you know, they were looking at additional remuneration if they wanted to take on newer tasks. Uh, again, they've re-verified that diagnostics and rehab at block level would be good. They warned us that internet is still poor. But we also found that audiology speech language pathologists were apprehensive to take on technology or creative work because they felt overloaded administratively. Now, obviously, some parts of it, we could build it into our model, but some parts of it were administrative. We took the findings and we submitted it as a report to the government uh, for them to take cognizance. And I must say that uh, over time, we've built a relationship of trust. And when we take these reports, we see that they are getting translated uh, to some of their new policies or new plannings that they are doing. Parallel to this qualitative assessment, we also did a geospatial analysis to exactly see what is the spread of existing children with disability between zero to six years based on government records. And then what is the spread of available diagnostic centers for disability and available rehabilitation centers? Now, these are just centers in terms of buildings, but doesn't mean that they will be staffed and that we looked at separately. But what we found was that on an average, they were traveling about 40 kilometers to be able to even reach a place that offered any service for a child with disability. Now, here, when we looked at who's available in these centers, clearly there was no speech language pathologist. There was no psychologist. If at all, any cardo was decently represented it was a special educators. And there was one audiologist is to 260 children with disability between zero to six years of age. So just imagine providing therapy, oral rehab for 260 children being just one person. So, uh, and also as, you know, I, I, those of you interested, I'd please go uh, read the systematic review of the low middle income country ed programs that you know we brought out recently where we say how the system is getting drained because audiologists in low and middle income countries are focusing heavily on screening and are not really getting to do so much diagnostics and rehabilitation so with all this information we retweaked our model where we looked at 
the comprehensive model integrated into the public health system uh, with various cadres being represented uh, you know at the screening level at the diagnostic testing level and at the tele rehabilitation level who would do what and where and we from the lab remotely take over these systems and perform the rehabilitation and diagnostic assessments so we involve the upgraded primary health centers the block resource centers of the education department nurses teachers special educators within these education departments computer assistants to sort of then provide these services and for the diagnostic assessment as i said we were piggybacking on a mobile van which was already available with the department of differently abled which we converted into a tele diagnostics van so very quickly uh, we developed a screening app for speech language and developmental disability with the help of uh, some of our students post graduate students and we validated these tools it's currently available in tamil and english but as we are getting requests from other states we are able to quickly develop in other languages and provide it we validated the tool as well as field validated the app with the help of grassroots workers we also developed a low cost mobile tablet based hearing screener uh, and this was developed particularly for the age group of 0 to 6 years which is currently really not available much uh, you know if you look at the literature for adults every as i'm talking there'll be 50 apps that come out but for children we have very very limited resources so this has a high risk factor screening checklist as a screening tool it has a parent questionnaire based screening checklist it has the behavioral observation audiometry it has a module of speech spectrum awareness task based screening and a speech recognition task based screening these we have again looked at their sensitivity specificity uh, and what and right now we're targeting this as a 60 percent 40% which is 60 decibels of hearing loss that's the screening level but we have put an r and d to lower this level we've taken the slightly higher level because that's the level that's considered as disabling hearing loss for social welfare schemes within the government here currently so we've also you know while hrrs and pq parental questionnaires are slightly dismissed because of uh, you know low sensitivity specificity actually it has a very good application for mass screening in very resource limited regions and we've particularly identified the age groups and the exact items that will help in picking these disability uh, hearing loss with good sensitivity specificity and these are now converted to apps and we are planning to make this available at no cost to anyone who wants to use it in any context we've conducted now training programs for nurses and special educators to do the screening and we have trained the facilitators to be able to plug up for remote diagnostic assessments within the van we've done public engagement to disseminate information about the program about the facilities that we are bringing in and also a little bit on early identification and we used four cart methods uh, to be able to make it more engaging and understandable we went back to all the frontline cadres that are involved in childhood disability as well as generally in children like the village health nurses the anganwadi workers and disseminated information about this program so this is what it looks like the child comes into for screening with the uh, ssa workers then they come in for diagnostics to the upgraded primary health centers and then once they are identified with either a communication disorder or speech, uh, or hearing loss uh, they move to rehab so currently they get hearing aids and cochlear implants through the government scheme but temporarily we provide them with hearing aids so that they quickly come on board for demonstration therapies while they are still getting on the wait list for the government aids and appliances uh as a translation of this project this has now become a part of a larger pilot of a world bank funded flagship project uh, for the for the differently able persons which is called the tn rights and we directly serve as expert committee members on this project and we are also now slowly talking to other governments within our country and as i said there is some interest internationally in other asian low and middle income countries to translate these models and if any of you listeners are interested in 
taking our support to build similar models in your context, we're very, very happy to extend our support to you. This happens from the lab where I am currently talking to you from and with the fantastic support and passion of several postgraduate students, PhD scholars, postdoctoral fellows, field workers, field assistants. Of course, we have project assistants and research fellows uh, that steer the entire work. Uh, we have several publications from this current project as well. And I urge you to read these if you're really interested or write to me and I'll be very happy to share it with you. I'm also very thankful to the mentorship and advice uh, we get from some of our national and international experts on various aspects, uh, you know, that guide that they, that they provide their expertise on. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and you're interested to know more or interested to take some of this uh, into your country, especially if you come from a low middle income setting, you can reach to me through my email, LinkedIn, or we have a website. Uh, the QR code is displayed for your perusal. Thank you very much once again. And thanks to IALP uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, to this IALP membership. Thank you again.